Well, thank you very much, James, and thank you very much, everybody. And can I just say how delighted I, I am, I was to discover on receiving an email from James that Oxford has a von Mises Society. So there is hope, ladies and gents. It is the, the von Mises Society, that, that is right. So that's, that's great. And um, James did actually ask me to, to do a talk, um, Daylight Robbery, all about my book. Um, but I thought more interesting was the future of work, tax and money. So that's what I've called this talk. But we'll start off talking about daylight robbery. And I'll talk for about an hour or so, no, 45 minutes or so. Uh, w when I see you shifting in your seats, then I'll stop talking and we can do a QA. and a And um, so that's me. Yes, I'm on the, the author of those three books. The first book uh, uh, on Bitcoin from a recognized publisher um, and the best book on Bitcoin, according to my mother. And, um, uh, and read it and glimpse into the future, said Richard Branson, though it's not actually clear uh, he ever read it. Um, now, we, uh, I thought a fun way to start the talk, um, as this is the, um, uh, the, 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 the von Mises Society, would be to discover who is the most libertarian person in the room. And we're going to test your values and we're going to do a, a quick questionnaire and we're going to discover who is the, 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 the most libertarian person. And, and because um, this is a libertarian subject and we believe in competition and free markets and all those kind of sensible things, um, there is a prize. We're going to have a competition to discover who is the most libertarian person in the room. And the winner of the competition will uh, get... I have a, a newsletter at Substack, which is now one of the top 20... Uh, financial newsletters in the world and it's free and you should all subscribe. There is also a paid um, version where you get all sorts of uh, free investment tips and uh, it's worth £250 a year and the winner of this competition will get one of those uh, free subscriptions, one of the paid subscriptions for nothing worth £250 a year. So I'm going to ask you all to stand up ladies and gents and we're going to answer, I'm going to ask you some questions and you have to answer those questions either put, by putting your hands on your head or your hands on your backside. And the first question I'm going to ask you is this, um, uh, is taxation theft, hands on your heads, or are taxes the price we pay for a civilised society? hands on your backsides. Is taxation theft or are taxes the price we pay for a civilised society? So would everyone uh, with their hands on their backsides please sit down? Taxation is of course theft. And um, I'm very concerned at the answers uh, in, uh, in the room because normally that question weeds out about 90% of the audience and in fact on this occasion it's only weeded out two. Um, so we have anyway... Well, exactly, exactly, exactly. Now, which is preferable, a United Kingdom or a confederation of smaller city-states along the lines of the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy? Uh, a United Kingdom or a confederation of smaller city-states along the lines of the Anglo-Saxon heptarchy? Uh, everyone with their hands on their heads, please sit down. Um, a confederation of smaller city-states is infinitely preferable. Worryingly, uh, lots of you have survived the cull. Who was the better James Bond? Uh, Sean Connery, uh, hands on your heads, or Roger Moore, hands on your backsides? Who was the better James Bond? Sean Connery uh, or Roger Moore? Uh, do you not even know who Sean Connery and Roger Moore are? <laughs> <laughs> You're going like that. So, uh, Sean Connery, hands on your heads. Roger Moore, hands on your backsides. Um, everyone with their hands on their heads, please sit down. Uh, Roger Moore uh, was infinitely better. Uh, which leaves just three of you. So, we'll have the, um, uh, we'll have the, we'll have the showdown now. Um, uh, passports. Passports. Do we need them? Yes. Uh, or no? Do we need passports? Yes uh, or no? Uh, uh, the uh, correct answer is no, so I'm afraid, sir, you have to sit down. We don't need passports. And uh, so this is a showdown to you two. Um, uh, the NH uh, maybe this is, uh, the, the NHS is the best means to provide the best possible health care. No, stupid question, stupid question. Uh, Bitcoin fixes this. True uh, or false? Bitcoin fixes this. True uh, or false? There we go. Bitcoin fixes this. True. You've both gone with true and you're both correct. Um, the, uh, we'll have, okay, I'll ask you one last question. Um, which is better, marmalade uh, or apricot jam? <laughs> marmalade or apricot jam? Uh, I'm sorry to say the correct answer is marmalade. So, sir, you win a free subscription. What is your name, sir? Lawrence. Lawrence. Congratulations to Lawrence. You are the most libertarian person. 
in the room. Right. Um, I wrote a book about, I, I was of the opinion once upon a time that if you fix money, you fix the world. And uh, this, I was started writing about gold many years ago, and it was in writing about gold that I discovered the, the evils of debt-based fiat money and how it's created so much inequality. And I was convinced that if we go back to a gold standard, it would fix many of these problems. And then Bitcoin was invented, and here was a free market solution to the uh, problem of fiat money. And then I started to think further, and I started to think it's not just money that's the problem, that's the cause of so many of our evils. It is taxation. Ta you, ta money and tax are interlinked, but you design a society by the way you tax it. And then I started to think more and more about this, and um, I realised that there has never been in all history a civilization without taxation of some kind. Taxation is inevitable. There have been civilizations where taxation was voluntary, but it still existed. And even in the hunter-gatherer societies that predated civilization, there existed a sense of duty to the greater collective, which is the premise on which taxation mm. is based. Mm. And so that's the famous line. Many attribute it to Benjamin Franklin, who did say it, but it was actually a uh, 18th century farceur by the name of Christopher Bullock. And he said in one of his plays, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And he was right, they are inevitable. Even in ancient Mesopotamia, taxes existed. This is an ancient uh, a proverb from ancient Sumer. You can have a god, you can have a king, but the man to fear is the tax collector. There has never been a civilization without taxes of some kind. And yet, we don't think about taxes. And once you do, once you start to look at the world, at the world we live in today, at history, at the future, through this prism of taxation, so much becomes clear. Tax is power. Whether king or emperor or ruler, if they lose control of their tax base, they lose their power. Um, you can look at every war, every, pretty much every great event in history. If you dig around behind the scenes, you will find some kind of tax story at its heart. Every war in history was funded by some kind of tax. Often debt and tax, but debt is, as I'll discuss, a form of taxation. Um, tax makes war possible. Uh, but at the same time, war makes tax possible. There are many taxes that we have that only exist, income tax being the most famous example, that only exist because of a national emergency, a war. There's this long relationship between tax and war. If you want to end war, end taxes. <laughs> um, every conquest was, the purpose of the conquest was to take control of the tax base, the land, the labour, the produce, the profit. Every revolt was some kind of, every revolution was some kind of rising up against some kind of economic injustice perpetrated by the tax system. Um, we've got a picture there of the, uh, of the American uh, revolution. No taxation without representation was their war cry. Um, in nine, until 1942, ordinary Americans never paid income tax. And then suddenly, uh, the income tax existed it was invented during the Civil War <laughs> by Lincoln, um, and then it, was, then it died away, and then it was reintroduced in 1913, but it didn't affect ordinary Americans. It was only with the Revenue Act of 1942 that ordinary Americans um, became uh, affected by income tax. And there was a huge propaganda campaign to get Americans to accept uh, income tax. Irving Berlin was commissioned to write a song, and the song contained the lyric, I paid my income tax today, a thousand planes to bomb Berlin, they've got to be paid for, and I chipped in, I paid my income tax today. And was ever a lyric that more clearly demonstrated the relationship uh, between tax and war. And Donald Duck, the sort of typical American, if you like, the caricature of the typical American, the... Um, Homer Simpson, perhaps, of his day, was also introduced in this... In this 
a propaganda video to encourage Americans to pay their income tax. And Time magazine railed against it. They called it the biggest piece of machinery ever designed to separate dollars from citizens. But it was World War II that enabled income tax. But then after the crisis of World War II passed, income tax never went away. And it's a pattern you see throughout history. You need a crisis to get the crisis measures in, but after the crisis has passed, um, things never go back to what they were before. The, the, the OFS, of all people, um, uh, calls it the um, uh, ratchet effect. We saw it again with quantitative easing after 2008. The idea of quantitative easing would never have passed had there not been a, an emergency. Then the emergency of uh, the, G the global financial crisis passed, quantitative easing stayed and it's now the new normal. And once you dig around history, you find, I'll, I'll do a little challenge here, but um, anyone shout out a great event from history and I will endeavour to tell you the tax story, the untold tax story behind that event. The Battle of Waterloo. The Battle of Waterloo. Well, it was a war, so it was paid for with taxes. Um, I, I mean, there's probably a million other tax stories behind it, but you can, somebody give me another one. The assassination of JFK. The assassination of JFK. You're probably right. There probably isn't a tax story behind that one, except for the fact that he was, you know, at the top of the tax system and there was some kind of anger, some perceived injustice. But you can, you're probably right with that one. I hadn't, I, it's not one that anyone's ever shouted out before. But you can go... You can say the birth of Christ, the reason Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem was to pay taxes. Uh, had Caesar Augustus not levied that tax, they would never have been in Bethlehem. The crime for which Jesus was eventually crucified was forbidding to give tribute to Caesar. First men on the moon, a tax, um, uh, NASA was a tax funded operation and you can just go through behind every great religion there's a tax story of some kind, all detailed in the book. The only area where it's a bit dodgy is assassinations is a good one and natural disasters uh, but there's usually some kind of tax story in the rebuilding event afterwards so for example London was rebuilt after the great fire of London with a with a coal tax. JFK was ready to go after the deep state. Thank you there you well, go. I knew that. I, I, I didn't. Yeah. I, I don't read that <laughs> conspiratorial non... no I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> JFK was a big one on the, um, the thing that leaders never get. I, 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 can't, I haven't got the immediate recall on the quote, but the, the great lesson from history is that lower, higher taxes don't lead to greater revenue. Often lower taxes lead to greater revenue. Um, um, Laffer was a big proponent of that and Kennedy was also a big, there's a, quite a famous Kennedy quote. If I had my Wikipedia with me, I'd look it up. Many of our greatest buildings in history were built, you know, the pyramids were built with taxes, slavery as well. And um, we think of the Great Wall of China, uh, we think that um, wall was built to keep the Mongol hordes or the barbarian hordes out. It wasn't. It was built to collect duties. Uh, the same goes for Hadrian's Wall. Um, the names we have, we have because of tax. Um, until the 12th and 13th centuries, most of us would not have had surnames. And surnames were only introduced with poll taxes and the purpose of distinguishing people for the, for the purpose of <coughs> collecting taxation. And you would be named either by your job or by some defining physical characteristic where you lived, you, Mr. Hill, Mr. Field, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ford or you'd be named by your profession, Mr. Smith, Mr. Miller, whatever it is, or by your, um, who your dad was, John's son, uh, Will's son, William's, um, Mac Millen, or whatever it is. Um, and this has been the, 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 apparently the man who introduced surnames was the great, great Chinese emperor Fuji uh, in 2850 BC. And, um, but again, he introduced them for the same reason, for the collecting, collection of taxes. And we use tax to control and influence behaviour. That, that man you see there is Peter the Great of Russia. And he had this idea that 
that Russia was barbaric and it needed to become more sophisticated and more like Western Europe. And so he introduced a tax on beards. And uh, in order to prove that you'd paid the tax, you had to hang that token from your beard that uh, you can see the token there and it said beard tax paid. And on the other side of the token, it said the beard is a superfluous burden. <laughs> um, but we use taxes today, you know, uh, uh, to s discourage people from smoking or discourage sugary content in food or alcohol or, or the consumption of petrol or whatever it is. So we use tax to guide behavior. And taxes permeate everything that we do. What you see there is a picture of a, a Roman latrine and underneath you can see the actual genuine latrine so that image is probably not unlike what what Roman lavatories were like but can anyone tell me an activity uh, in life today that doesn't involve taxation of some kind? Sex, Sex that's thank you. Uh, that's the one, um, it, it, the bed you do it on is taxed. Um, but you're, you're right, that bodily functions are one of the few areas, are probably the only area that isn't taxed. But there have been, um, in the case of Vespasian, uh, the Roman emperor, he introduced urine taxes in ancient Rome. Urine was used um, for tanning and laundering and bizarrely for cleaning your teeth. And for some reason, I don't know where these ideas come from, but aristocratic Portuguese urine was considered the best urine in Europe and it was heavily prized but in any cases people would collect urine in buckets there, there would be um, these uh, pots and people would collect the urine and they would use it and it became such a lucrative endeavour that uh, Vespasian taxed it and he was told that the money his urine tax was dirty and, um, and he then said his reply was the gold is clean pecunia non olet and um, <coughs> so the money is clean and that's where we get this idea of dirty and clean money from, apparently, so the legend goes. But, and today, taxes, that's a picture of a pay slip there and I don't know if you can see it, but the, today taxes are deducted without choice, uh, by stealth in many cases, you often don't realise you're paying a tax, they're deducted at source, which makes it very difficult to withhold the tax and they're deducted by force. My agent, who's a stupid, deluded lefty, is always telling me that uh, they're not deducted by force, but they are, because if you don't pay them, you go to prison. And this is a far cry in, this hasn't always been the case, in ancient Athens, the uh, enlightened society that was ancient Athens, uh, taxation was voluntary. There was a system known as liturgy, and it was considered the responsibility of the richest people in society to help out the rest. And so if it was deemed that a road was needed or a bridge or a great games or a great piece of entertainment or a warship or whatever it was, they would be expected to pay for it. And not only would they be expected to pay for it, they would ex be expected to carry the work out and put their name on it. And this put great responsibility onto them because their reputation was at stake. And so as a result, what you often found that people paid many, much more tax than was required. Uh, and um, so it's a quite an effective system. If you want to pay more tax than you have to in the UK, you can't do it. You literally can't do it. Uh, it's, the system isn't flexible enough. So let me ask uh, everyone a question. What is the most expensive purchase you ever make in your life? Somebody shout out an answer. House. A house. That's the most commonly given answer. And uh, it is the wrong answer. The most expensive, per even at today's extraordinary house prices, the most expensive purchase you ever make in your life is your government. Mm -hmm. And over the course of your lifetime, <laughs> roughly 50% of everything you ever earn will be taken from you by force, at stealth, without choice, um, to pay for your government. Not just for your government, but, but for everybody else's as well. For your healthcare, but for everybody else's healthcare. Hello, sir. Does that figure include inflation and currency devaluation? Uh, a very wise question. And it's a rough figure. And if you, if you don't include currency debasement, it's actually a little bit lower. 
And I think you're, are you American? I heard an American accent. So the figure is slightly lower in America than it is in the UK. We pay more in Europe. I think France is at something like 55%. Um, but if you include inflation and currency debasement, then it's well beyond 50%. And, you know, what is, inf what is inflation? Milton Friedman, it's taxation without legislation. Um, but one way or the other, and debt is the other means, and debt is a tax on the future. So I like to use taxation as a measure of freedom. And Margaret Thatcher was famous for saying, you can't have freedom without economic freedom. How much of your labor do you own? And uh, in an anarchy where there's no taxation, uh, a worker owns 100% of his labor. And in a totalitarian state, North Korea or somewhere, the worker owns none of his own labor. I guess a slave doesn't even own his own labor, he doesn't even own his own body. Our existence is not unlike the existence of the medieval serf who gave half his working week to his lord and the other half of his working week um, he was able to keep for himself. But over the course of your life, roughly 20 or 25 years will be given working for the state in exchange for health care, defence, police, education and all the rest of it. Not just for yourself, but for other people as well. Now this is the, um, the purpose of taxation is of course to equalise life chances. You give it to the government and they're going to redistribute it to those more in need than yourself and as a result the inequality gap will close. Except the inequality gap hasn't closed, it's wider than it's ever been. And that's the famous quote, that's the uh, Inland Revenue Services, the IRS building in, in America that has inscribed um, in its facade, taxes are what we pay for a civilised society. And uh, that's uh, from an American journalist, writer, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. Um, but is it civilised? When you, let's say, for example, you disagree with uh, the war in Iraq, or whatever the decision the government's recently, say you disagree with windfall taxes, the government's taken decision this week, you have no choice. The only choice you have is an election every five years that doesn't really make any difference to anything anyway. And so my big argument in a zombie film, you'll often, a trope of a zombie film is often this idea of patient zero, the, the, the place where the zombie virus originated. And the hero of the zombie film has to get to patient zero and either kill it or somehow patient zero has the antidote. And if you can get to patient zero, you can cure the world. And my argument is that our system of tax is patient zero. And you think of how powerless many politicians claim to be and they go into politics to change the world and all the rest of it and find they can't do anything. Um, I met uh, Tim... Uh, I didn't actually meet Tim Yo, Yo, the politician. I met somebody who quoted him the other day, but apparently he used to call the House of Commons the Cathedral of Broken Dreams. <laughs> but anyway, my argument is that our patient zero, if you want to fix the world, fix our system of tax. It all starts there. You design a society where you tax it. Now, this is a great quote from an English historian, A.J.P. Taylor, with, with which some of you will be very familiar. It's the opening passage of his book, English History, 1914 to 45. I'll read it out for you. Um, Until August 1914, a sensible, law-abiding Englishman could pass through life and hardly notice the existence of the state beyond the post office and the policeman. He could live where he liked and as he liked. He had no official number or identity card. He could travel abroad uh, or leave his country forever without a passport or any sort of official permission. He could exchange his money for any other currency without restriction or limit. He could buy goods from any other country in the world on the same terms as he brought, bought goods at home. The Englishman paid taxes on a modest scale, less than 8% of the national income, and the state only acted to help those who could not help themselves. It left the adult citizen alone. Now that sounds like a glorious paradise, a libertarian paradise. This is the world that we acolytes of von Mises dream of. And um, 
he mentions tax at less than 8%. At that point, 1910, tax across Western Europe was about 8, 10% of GDP. Um, and that is the historical average. It's a number, the tithe. It's a number that goes all the way back to ancient Sumer. It's common to all religions. Um, you give one-tenth of what you earn. Now, obviously, in ancient times, most people didn't handle money, so they would give a tenth of their labor or a tenth of their produce and so on. And it's thought that the number, the tenth, was arrived at because we have 10 fingers, it was just an easy number to calculate. And it all started to go tits up after World War I, basically. Now, what I find interesting about that quote, that's the sort of, it's so often quoted by people who argue for small government. But actually, in many ways, we are more liberated, more empowered, today than we were then, than we, are, than we have been at any time in history. And that's because of technology. So it's all very well saying you can go anywhere in the world without a passport, but how'd you get there? <laughs> Whereas today we have planes and wonderful cars and, and all the rest of it. You know, we have mobile phones and we can speak to anyone in the world. We have access to unlimited information. So in one sense, we're less free because less of our labor is owned. But then in another sense, and something I think we have to celebrate, and that's a, a, a result of productivity and standing on the shoulders of giants and the combined intelligence of every human being that's ever existed before us. Sorry, not the combined, the accumulated intelligence. We have wonderful, we are empowered in a way that we never were before. So I'm not gonna dwell on that slide. Now, so that's, um, uh, my thoughts on taxation. That's my book about taxation, why it's so important. And you just all go out and, and buy the book and study it and it should become a set text at Oxford. Um, I'm now going to move on to the future of work, tax and money. Um, we've got about another 15 or 20 minutes. And I just want to describe various things that are going on in the world. And something we've experienced over the last 30 years has been the rise of the intangible economy. And these incredible valuations inscribed to intangible things and this entire change of mentality. So um, I'm quite close to my mum and she just loves stuff. She's got a beautiful Georgian tall boy and she never stops talking about this tall boy. She's got... Uh, you know, Georgian bone, Wedgwood bone china sets and Georgian silver tea sets. And she just loves stuff and her stuff is beautiful. But I just look at that and go, that's just, it just so takes so much. It's a burden. It's not an asset, it's a burden. And so if you look at the, I gather that Walmart has greater revenues than Amazon. And yet Amazon is roughly, is, is valued at three, four times the value of Walmart. You look at the valuations ascribed to Google and Facebook compared to Penguin Random House or the New York Times. Wealth is no longer tangible. Uh, trademark, it's wealth is trademarks, IP, equity, licensing, crypto, all these intangible things. In 1990, the Three biggest companies in Detroit, and Detroit was still the center of American industry, believe it or not, in 1990. The three biggest companies had a market cap of 36 billion and employed one million people. Today, the three biggest companies in Silicon Valley, the market cap is 110 times higher. They're 110 times more valuable. Now, part of that is currency debasement, but they employ a quarter of as many people. And that is a very telling statistic about the way the nature of work has gone and will continue to go. Google and Facebook and Apple, so many people use them as platforms, um, uh, you know, as means to earn income, but they're not employees of those companies. And something similar has happened with money. Once upon a time, money would be physical. You'd use gold and silver or paper notes. Now, 
just 3% of money exists as cash. The number's probably, that's a statistic from five years ago, the number's probably lower. Now, 97% of money is digital. Now, this is quite an interesting chart. It's a bit higgledy-piggledy at this stage, but it's, I've taken the prices of an average load of things from 1970 and compared the prices of those things today. And so, for example, the average salary is 20 times today what it was in 1970. But the average house, on the other hand, <laughs> on the other hand is 65 times. So house prices have gone up at more than three times the rate of salaries. Um, now you look at, I've got two cars there, the Ford Cortina and the Range Rover. They're about 30 or 40 times <coughs> uh, more expensive than they were in 1970. Now those cars um, are probably a lot better than they were in 1970. They, they've got all sorts of electrical gizmos and Bose speakers and, and air conditioning and all sorts of wonderful things that they didn't have in <coughs> 1970. But you would still expect with improved productivity in cars for the prices of those things to have come down. A pint of beer is 30 times as much. A pint of milk is only nine times as much. A gallon of petrol, 16 times as much. A dozen eggs, 20 times as much. A washing machine, only four times as much. But a phone call is infinitely cheaper. A, phone, a local phone call for six minutes in 1970, in 1976, I couldn't find the number for 1970, but a local phone call for six minutes in, would have cost you 10p. Now I can have a video call with anyone anywhere for nothing. So what you're seeing is all sorts of dynamics. Firstly, technology driving the prices of some things incredibly low. Same has happened with a washing machine to a certain extent. We don't use debt for the most part, to buy washing machines. We pay cash. So the price of a washing machine is only determined by the availability of cash at the time. Similarly with eggs um, and, and milk. Beer is heavily taxed, as is petrol. And so the, it's tax as well as the cost of those things that have pushed up the prices. But we do use um, debt to buy cars. And it's the increase in debt that has pushed cars up. It's, 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 it's debt and also there's a heavily tax regulated industry, 20% VAT on cars. And of course houses, we use enormous amounts of debt to buy houses. It is the availability of debt that has pushed up house prices. And all this has conspired to uh, lower the value of money. Now this I think is the most telling chart in the whole world and it comes from our man, Our World in Data, which is um, the website that's resulted from that book uh, by Hans Rosler, the name of which I forget, but it's, it's uh, what's it? Our, it's called Our World in Data, his book, I think. Anyway, it's a fantastic book. But if you look at that chart, you will see that the price of goods and services was pretty constant for 350 years <laughs> and it's only since the 20th century where the price of things has suddenly gone bananas and if you look at the eight uh, this chart shows that it more clearly it's a logarithmic chart this chart shows consumer prices in previous in previous centuries so there's the 20th century where the price of everything has gone nuts okay but now we're going to look this is the 18th century you look at the prices of things in, in 1816, that was the great recoinage, and by 1900, they were much lower. Stuff got cheaper all the way through the 19th century because money was sound and it couldn't be debased and printed. But that's an incredibly telling statistic. And if you want to understand the inequality gap, those are your two charts. Now, money, of course, then was gold. Um, and we talked about the rise of the intangible economy. Gold is the single most tangible substance in the world. It's the oldest substance on earth, result of supernovae collisions, thousands of, probably hundreds of thousands, billions of years old. 
and it was the very first metal we used. We used it in the Stone Age, long before the Bronze Age, before we discovered smelting, when we were still using stone and wooden tools. We were using, we'd find bits of gold in riverbeds and we'd use it to decorate ourselves along with precious stones and, and um, shells and bones and whatever else we used. But we also would use it as reward. Well done, mate, James, you've done a fantastic job inviting me. There's a bit of gold for you. Um, for completing a task for heroic deeds as an expression of gratitude. It was a symbol of status. Look at me, I've got access to this metal you want to make with me. And, um, but it was primitive money and it was the very first metal we used and it's probably be the, end up being the last metal we used. Um, and we used it long before any other metal, but at the same time, what you see here is money in ancient Mesopotamia. You would have a token. This is the first systems of debt. So um, a cone like that would represent a measure of barley or a disc would represent a sheep and two discs would be two sheep and so on. And then you'd bake the tokens inside a clay ball and when the debt was settled, you smash open the clay ball. And that was the very first promissory money, the first debt, first way debts were recorded. And by the way, those first debts that were recorded were taxes. <laughs> so you could argue that taxes gave us handwriting. And then people over time found that instead of baking tokens inside clay balls, it was quicker just to inscribe the clay with pictures instead. And so did we invent the first hieroglyphs. Um, and as I say, the first systems of handwriting were taxes owed. And there you have your modern equivalent. And so my argument here is that money, what we use as money, is defined by technology. And in fact, money drives forward technology. And we had the first use of clay there, mud in ancient Mesopotamia as people came down from the hills into the, into the uh, Tigris and the Euphrates. And then the invention of coinage, one of the most brilliant technologies in, invented ever, where you could certify the amount of metal, uh, the weight of metal and the amount of metal in a coin and the certification would be in the stamp of the ruler. Then with the invention of the printing press, first in China and then in the West, we started using paper money representing coins. Then with the invention of digital technology, now, as I said, 97% of money um, is digital and we have the latest evolution, which is cryptographic transfer. Now, in 1866, one of the first transatlantic messages was broadcast across the uh, Atlantic Ocean after the first cables were laid. And up until this point, it had taken, uh, it would take two weeks to send a message from Britain to America by ship, 10 days to two weeks. And then they laid these cables and it took 10 years, loads of bankruptcies. I think three or four different ventures went bankrupt trying to lay the first transatlantic cable. But eventually in 1866, a message was sent from Queen Victoria to President uh, Johnson. And there was this picture, uh, I love this picture here, awaiting the reply. And so all these people just sat there waiting for the message to come through by telex. And um, the slogan was two weeks to two minutes. Great slogan. And it, the, this cable transformed the relationship, political, personal, commercial, transformed relationships between Western Europe and America. And within a week, two trusted parties of, the, of that laying of that cable in the first message, two trusted parties sent a message to each other agreeing a transfer. And the first exchange rate between the dollar and the pound was agreed. And that's why the dollar and the pound is always referred to as cable. Goes back to that. And so but within that moment, the dollar pound exchange rate. So again, I talked about money being technology. You can't send gold or paper down the uh, telegraph, but you can send a message. And uh, so money is pr promissory. And I, I'm a bit wary talking about cycles because I think you can look back at history and, and find a cycle and declare uh, it's a pattern and it's all a bit higgledy-biggledy and arbitrary, but nevertheless, if you look at the history of money over the last four or five hundred years, in the early 1600s, after the invention of the printing press, we had the first what, running cash notes, printed money representing gold held in a, in a vault. Um, 
in 16, I think it was 1698, Isaac Newton became, joined the Bank of England. We had inflation. Uh, all our silver was being melted down and sold in France on the continent. William was at war. And Isaac Newton had the first great recoinage. And a guinea, named after the gold that came from Guinea, um, became the pound coin. And we were on a, that settled the monetary system for about 70 or 80 years. And then William Pitt took us off the gold standard in, to, pay, to print the money to pay for the Napoleonic Wars. After Napoleonic Wars, 1816, we had another great recoinage and the sovereign became the pound coin. And that lasted until 1914. Then in 1914, to uh, print the money that was needed to pay for World War I, the British, the French and the German governments all took themselves off the gold standard. If they'd stayed on the gold standard, World War I would have had to have ended when the money ran out, when the gold ran out. But it didn't. They were able to print the money and that war was able to go on for way longer with far more terrifying consequences, not just to individuals and families, but to our whole country than should ever have been possible under the discipline of gold. And then here we are, 100 years later, with cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin uh, entering the mainstream. Now, one of the reasons for the success of the um, intangible economy against the tangible economy is this thing of scalability. So let's say I invent a brilliant hand gel, best hand gel in the world. I've still got to find a factory to manufacture all these bottles and I've still got to distribute all these bottles of hand gel everywhere in the world and I've got to deal with all the uh, problems that each country offers with, you know, the regulatory and so on problems. But if I invent a brilliant app, I can just upload the app to the app store and it can be down, I upload it once and it can be downloaded a billion times. I write a brilliant song, upload it, it can be downloaded a billion times. So there's a scalability to digital because of its replicability that doesn't exist in the physical economy. And it's that scalability that in my re view is the reason that the intangible economy has eclipsed the tangible economy. Now with that mentality of scalability, I want you to consider most currencies that we know, the pound, the dollar, the euro, they're limited by one, by borders. So even though the US dollar is an international currency, it's still limited by it national, but it's very hard for people outside of the US to open a bank account. If you're somewhere in the developing world, you're unbanked altogether. How do you get US dollars? How do you, uh, your, a bank account in your own country, less, let alone US dollars? Still 2 billion people unbanked in the world. And other currencies do peg themselves to the dollar, but by doing that, they're importing um, US monetary policy, which they may not want to do. So national currencies, as we know them, are limited one by borders, but also by regulation. And as I say, to use cryptocurrencies, you only need a internet connection. And the other day I, I was walking by St. Martin's in the fields where all the homeless people, um, where the homeless charity is, and there was a load of homeless guys all sat against the wall. It was a nice sunny morning waiting for their breakfast that they get given. And they're all sat there praying on their phones. So even the homeless people have phones. And, well. and some of them probably, there you go, I didn't know that, but, and credit card readers as well. But the, uh, around the world now, we're not quite at the point, we're at the point where more people have a smartphone than have a toilet. But we're not quite at the point where everyone has a smartphone, but we are not far, we're only like a year or three away from that point. And once you've got your smartphone with your internet connection, all the stuff you have to go through to get a bank account is irrelevant because you can start receiving um, cryptocurrency straight away. So there is a scalability. I regard Bitcoin as, as the currency of the internet. And there is a scalability to it that just doesn't exist um, in national currencies. And I... I urge people who are skeptical about the potential of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to think in terms of scalability because it changes the way you view things. Um, Facebook tried to invent a, tried to get a cryptocurrency going called DM um, and it made, the mistake it made was seeking permission. Uh, it should have, it should have made it 
and then seek forgiveness, sought forgiveness. But just to give you an idea of the extraordinary potential, I, I think I read a stat that if Facebook, if Indian people who used Facebook were a country in themselves, it would be the fourth most populous country in the world. That's just Indian users of Facebook. Um, Facebook has three billion users worldwide. WhatsApp has about two billion. Instagram has one and a half. So there's just this huge network of people. Now, as soon as people are able to start sending money across that network as easily as they send text messages, and the technology is there, um, the, the potential is extraordinary. And it has consequences because we can send money across borders. It's, the money would be beyond the control of, of traditional banking and regulation. It's much, much, it's very difficult to tax. It relies on the honesty of the uh, person making the money. Now, people will often say about Bitcoin and crypto, it's tulips. Um, but what is the definition of a bubble? And my definition of a bubble is a bubble is a bull market in which you don't have a position. Um, and in any case, we need bubbles. It's tulips. Here we are 400 years, 390 years after the tulip bubble in Holland. And Amsterdam is still the centre of the global flower industry. <laughs> you know, it's bubbles accelerate investment and they make things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. So we need bubbles. And um, I was just having a drink earlier with my friend Lewis over there who tutored my son uh, and, and got him an A at, uh, uh, in, in his A-level maths and Lewis is studying here. But I was just, he, and he's just finishing off this year and we were talking about what, what Lewis, he was talking about what he wants to do next. And I was alerted him to this fact, the extraordinary power of technology in the world today. The combined market cap of Apple, Alphabet, Amazon, Microsoft and Facebook, it's a bit lower than nine trillion now because there's been a bit of a correction. But that, that combined market cap makes it the third most powerful nation on earth in terms of wealth. You know, American GDP is 20 trillion, China's 13. Tech is extraordinarily powerful and it's not based anywhere. It's the IPs here, it's corporate profits are there. And, you know, it's, it's global. And we're going to go into a world in which tech, you know, the laws won't be defined so much by nation states as by the platform. And laws will be set in code, designed by coders rather than lawmakers and democratically elected people. So I, I think I've talked about the future of money. We'll come now to the future of work. I'll be very quick on this. Um, I'm... I think I'm probably the last generation of people who grew up in a world in which you leave university or you leave school with a profession and you work for one or... My uncle, uh, he didn't even go to university, he left school, he got a job with BP and he worked for BP for his whole life. His whole life working for one company. And there are people who live like that. Um, that was normal in his day. You work your whole life for the civil service or whatever it is. Um, and it was a very easy model to tax because you have one guy, he goes to one place of work, the company is beholden to collect the tax revenue and it's the traditional employment model. But we're going into a world now in which people have multiple income streams, multiple jobs, more and more freelancers. Ernst and Young have predicted that by 2030, 50% of the American workforce will be contingent, more and more freelancers, the gig economy, and so on. COVID has normalized remote working. And um, in 2035, the global population at the moment is 7 billion. It'll probably be 9 billion by 2035, of which 6 billion will be workers. So 6 billion people around the world working. If 50% of the workforce is contingent, you're talking about 3 billion freelance workers around the world. Um, now, what is, can anyone tell me, what is the fastest growing workforce in the world? Anyone know this? The answer is digital nomads. People who work in the digital economy, but are not based anywhere. Now, I described the internet is a borderless medium. The digital economy is borderless. 
you look at all these com companies, their IP is in, their corporate headquarters are in Holland because that's where the lowest corporation tax is, their IP is somewhere else, their trademarks are somewhere else, and, and nation states have struggled to tax, you know, Amazon and Starbucks and so on because they're globalised models, their, their tax systems can't keep up with these globalised models. Workers are going the same way. Workers are becoming borderless too. And all you youngsters at students uh, about to leave university, I would all urge you all to embrace this digital economy because people have found they can do one job, they can do that job in London, but actually they can go to Thailand or Portugal or Malta or Colombia or wherever it is, do the same job, London wages, the costs, without London costs. And cheap, I, I, I must have put this slide together before, <laughs> before COVID because cheap travel no longer exists. Um, but high house prices, fast internet systems, global rollout of 5G, the high house prices in London, people are like, I don't want to live in London, it's too expensive, I'll go and live in Portugal or wherever, it's cheaper. But above all, the most expensive purchase you ever make in your life, your government, is removed when you become a digital nomad. And you, how many people, have, you might have met people who've gone to Dubai and worked in Dubai where there's no income tax for five years, made a fortune and then come back here. Um, and there are huge communities of digital nomads that have risen up and, you know, huge chat boards. And they're going to need borderless money if they do, if they do a job in... Uh, they're in Portugal, they're hired to do a job in Thailand for a company in Thailand, then they complete the job when they're in Brazil and then they end up in Colombia when they get paid. Who do they pay tax to and how much? It's not clear. And already 50% of digital nomads operate in the crypto economy. Um, and it's, it's thought that as many as one in three contingent workers are nomadic in some kind. So that points to a number of roughly a billion digital nomads by 2035. And I just think there are huge opportunities in that world. If you look at the combination of the digital economy and the uh, losing of the most expensive purchase you ever make. And many people become digital nomads because they are angry with their country. They're angry at the inequality gap. They're angry at the lack of opportunity that, that's been presented to them. They're angry at high prices. They don't feel any loyalty. So they don't feel any obligation to pay taxes to where they came, came from. Um, if they're not using the services, if they're not using healthcare or the roads or whatever it is, why should they pay taxes? And in the case of the UK, once you're out of the UK for, um, it, it's, I think it's 90 days, if you spend less than 90 days in the UK in a given year, then you're not obliged to pay taxes to the UK. And, and then that goes up to half a year. So technology is making non-DOM status, you know, this non-DOM, the thing that only exists for the super rich. Technology is making non-DOM status possible for everyone. And I think this is going to be a huge trend. Now, 50% of government revenue worldwide comes from income tax. It's taxed at source. Traditional employment model, easy to tax. The government has struggled to tax Amazon and Starbucks. It struggles to tax the intangible economy. It's going to lose a huge workforce to it. How's it going to tax nomads? Um, as I said, nomads feel little duty to, uh, to the country of origin in many cases. Um, how's government going to replace lost revenue? It's already um, racking up huge debts. I think we're going to see higher consumption taxes, probably some kind of wealth tax, more inflation. I think Rishi printed 15 billion <laughs> this week, was it? Um, and this is the problem. When one body in a society has the power to print money at no cost to itself and nobody else has that power, society is inev inevitably going to be disproportionately weighted in, in favour of that body that has the power to print money at no cost to itself. That's why government's so big. As well as um, inflation and so on, you will see the more aggressive collection of taxes as pressures of government debt grow. But, it, but there are only certain people, you're going to almost see this two-tiered um, uh, 
individuals described by William Reese Mogg in his book, The Sovereign Individual, where you have these global nomads who flip from place to place, and then people who, are, for whatever reason, are trapped in the physical economy in their own countries, burdened with heavy taxation. Another thing we're going to see is more surveillance and controls. Technology enables that. Um, I just discussed the, um, the, the two classes of people, but if the nature of tax changes, then so will the nature of government. And another dynamic we're going to see is just tech replacing government services. So already in London, you can get an Uber. If two of you get an Uber over a short journey, it's cheaper than a train fare, tube fare. And you'll see more and more tech in education and healthcare and so on, providing those services and doing them better than government. And that, ladies and gentlemen, completes my presentation. That is where the world is going. And embrace your digital nomadery and flee this tyrannical state is my advice. Thank you very much. <laughs>